Hello, it's Scott Manley here. After getting us all excited before Christmas, Beetlejuice has stopped dimming and started getting brighter again. So yes, it's not going to explode. I told you so. But yeah, it's actually now getting brighter again. And of course, people are now really starting to look hard at the data and finally tease out some results and figure out why it got so dim, why it almost became the third brightest star in the constellation of Orion. Many people thought that the dimming was really the coinciding of the 425 day cycle and the 5.9 year cycle. If they both reached a low point at the same time then, that would explain to a certain extent the, dark, the dimming. Uh, and if that was the case, then they expected the brightness to start rising again in the middle of February and that's what it did. But that still doesn't explain a mechanism. Betelgeuse has this massive convectively driven atmosphere which is constantly boiling and convecting and turning over. We get hot spots and we get cold spots and perhaps they had too many cold spots. Earlier in the month, Miguel Montargas uh, at the European Southern Observatory took this image of the disk of Betelgeuse and you can see that there is a definite darker area in the bottom right. Now, is that a cloud floating over it? Is that area cooler? Is uh, just the car star just changing color? There's many, many possible explanations, some more likely than others. Now, another team led by Pierre Carvella used the same telescope, but with a different instrument called Visor, to take a, an infrared image of the area surrounding Betelgeuse. And what you've got here is the black area they've had to mask out because the star is so bright. And these are dust clouds emitting light in the infrared. And in the middle of that, we have the image that was taken by the other team just to see it for scale. So this is a dust cloud that is coming off of Betelgeuse. We, we know that Betelgeuse produces these dust grains. The question is, is that responsible for the dimming? Because these dust clouds are a long way from the star. It will take years for dust emitted now to get out this far that we can actually see it today. So just because we can see this older dust around the star doesn't really help us figure out whether new dust is responsible for the dimming of Betelgeuse. But I want to look at one specific paper, which, well, mainly because it was very well explained by its authors, Emily Levesque and Philip Massey. They gave a great explanation on Twitter. It's not revolutionary. It just does everyday stellar astronomy. It asks the question, what is the temperature of Betelgeuse? Has it dropped? Is that going to explain the dropping brightness? As you probably know, basic physics says that the temperature of the body defines the color of the light that comes off of it. There's a simple law that defines what's called black body radiation. And you might think it would be very simple to look at a star and see which light curve it matches and therefore figure out the temperature. That would be great, but real stars are not ideal black bodies. They have different chemistry, they have different ions, and all the atoms, the ions, potentially molecules, interact to produce a spectrum, which is a mess. It's not something that you can very easily fit to this nice, perfect shape. One of the really important landmark materials in the atmospheres of M-type you know, red stars is titanium oxide. So titanium oxide, the titanium obviously doesn't come from inside the star because the star is still too young. At this point, Betelgeuse is still probably burning helium into oxygen and carbon. It's space dust that has fallen in or was in there during the formation. Uh, uh, Betelgeuse will actually produce titanium probably in the last couple of days of its life. But we probably won't see that in the star because we won't have time to get dredged up from the core into the atmosphere before the core collapses and the star goes supernova. But titanium oxide is a really good absorber of all sorts of colors. And that's the reason why a lot of dyes and paints actually use titanium oxide to give white paint. In hotter atmospheres, the titanium doesn't bond to the oxygen because it's simply too hot to hold on to each other. But as the temperature drops to around 3500 Kelvin, you start to get the titanium oxide forming and that drastically changes the spectrum. And that's one of the, the hallmarks of the class M atmospheres. So as the star cools, not only does the black body radiation drop off, but the titanium oxide in the atmosphere also reduces the luminosity a bit as well. 
Now this spectra is a really good example showing you how the K-type stars are warmer and the M stars are colder. And as you go down, those dotted lines correspond to where the titanium oxide lines are. So as it gets cooler, you see those dotted lines correspond to deeper and deeper gouges out of the spectrum, making it darker there. This strong temperature dependence also means it's a really good marker for helping you estimate the temperature of stars. So instead of trying to match the entire black body curve and figure out where it is, what astronomers do is they look at these lines and they look that as they get stronger or weaker, that corresponds to certain temperature ranges. And sometimes they compare them to other stars, or sometimes the spectra are compared to models where they simulate a bunch of gas or ions at a certain temperature and they see what color light it would theoretically produce. So now you understand that, the astronomers, they took a spectra of Betelgeuse using the Lowell Discovery Telescope, uh, when they had to actually use filters on it because Betelgeuse is too damn bright, and then they compare that against a previous spectra from 2004. And of course, when you put these side by side, or rather on top of each other, you can see that the 2004 Betelgeuse was a whole lot brighter. But when they actually compared the depths of the titanium oxide lines, they looked very close. It suggested that if there was a temperature change, it was not a significant change at all. So the next step is to compare it against other similar stars. These are also red supergiants elsewhere in the Milky Way, so we can get good spectra on them. Some are slightly warmer, some are slightly cooler, and you're looking for the one that has the best spectral fit. And then finally, they compare the spectra against a model created using the MARX code. That's a stellar atmospheres code that was developed at uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. So comparing against all these standards, the team arrived at a temperature of 3600 Kelvin. The 2004 models suggested that it was about 3650 Kelvin. So that was a cooling of 50 Kelvin, but... That is not enough to explain it. A cooling of 50 Kelvin suggests a 0.4 magnitude drop, but Betelgeuse had dropped by over 1.1 magnitude, so there was a big difference still there. Which, of course, brings us back to the title of the paper, which is Betelgeuse just isn't that cool. Effective temperature alone cannot explain the recent dimming of Betelgeuse. But... The team thought the spectrum does give them a clue as to what is causing the dimming. So come back to this picture comparing the real spectrum versus the model. The black line is the actual spectra, the red line is what the model says. And over on the left side, that's the shorter wavelength. So you'll notice that the actual spectra has much, a bit more blue than the model predicts. And their suggestion is that this blue is scattered light from dust that has been recently thrown off by Betelgeuse. Specifically, they say giant dust. So regular interstellar dust is really, really tiny, and it preferentially scatters blue light, so it makes objects appear redder. But as the dust grains get larger, this preferential scattering starts to go away. In the atmospheres of giant stars, these dust grains can form to be larger since they're held together for a long time. And then if there's an event in the atmosphere which blows off a bunch of dust, this dust doesn't scatter in the same way as regular interstellar dust. So this is an effect the team had previously seen, so they knew to look for it and they, they understood what they were seeing. Now look, this is a single paper. There are other people working that may come to other conclusions. I just wanted to cover this one because the honestly, the explanation on social media was so well put together and, and I realized that I could explain it. I, I've worked with people that have done this, but I was never a stellar astronomer. I was all about asteroids, but I understood that what stellar atmospheres were and how all this stuff could behave. And of course, this paper came along at just the right time as Betelgeuse started getting brighter again. There are other people that are looking at it. They will come up with their own data. Maybe they'll agree. Maybe we'll find something cooler. You know, Betelgeuse is this big and complicated system. And obviously pointing all these instruments at Betelgeuse during this dimming event, we're likely to find out stuff that is new and surprising. And that's great because, you know, if you're a scientist, you always want new and surprising. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>